Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me from a balmy 84-degree room in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, is my dear friend, Dan Welch. Dan, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. Really looking forward to it. So why is it so hot in Gettysburg? I mean, aside just because you're there. Yeah, you know, and it seems to be anywhere I go, <laughs> there's always heat around um, one, way or, one way or the other. Now we've, uh, we've had a uh, just a long stretch of just uh, hot, humid temperatures this summer here in, in central, south central Pennsylvania. It's just been brutal and, uh, you know, living in some of the, uh, having the privilege of living in some of these historic homes on the battlefield come with their quirks. Um, you know, these homes don't come with, uh, you know, standard HVAC. There's no uh, historically accurate air conditioning. Uh, there is no historically accurate <laughs> air conditioner. So, you know, we, we've got AC for our rooms, but um, not every common room has has AC. So it's a little toasty uh, here in Gettysburg today and therefore uh, where I'm currently sitting. Well, I appreciate you taking some time to talk with us and uh, hopefully you won't melt as we discuss. <laughs> we're going to we're going to talk about something cool. See how I did that? I, I saw that. That was good. That was good. <laughs> a turn of phrase, as they say. <laughs> Um, I asked Dan to come and speak with us today because um, he's really helmed the project for us with Emerging Civil War to help us commemorate and celebrate our 10th anniversary, the Emerging Civil War 10th anniversary series that uh, I've been privileged to co uh, co edit with Dan. And uh, Dan, tell us a little bit about what is this series? Uh, what yet another new series from NCF? Yeah, you know, so this is a wonderful opportunity to not only revisit some of our most uh, read, most popular posts on certain topics, such as our first two volumes, one on Gettysburg and one on uh, Vicksburg and Tullahoma, but also to uh, let our, our, our cadre of historians go back, review those things, uh, update with new research that has come out since that uh, time period that they may have posted these five, six, seven, eight years ago. And also to um, really look at some things that uh, ECW hasn't covered before and have an opportunity to bring to light some other stories. Um, so this series is, is not only a way to celebrate and commemorate what uh, has been blogged about on Emerging Civil War for the last 10 years, but an opportunity for um, not only our, our readers, but also our, our historians and our authors to revisit some of these pieces from the last 10 years. And, and also add a little bit more to the, the burgeoning scholarship on many of these topics That's uh, that the 150th really drove um, almost 10 years ago now. Now, I think when I go to the record store, not that such things exist anymore, and I, and I buy like a greatest hits compilation, here are the greatest hits of the Rolling Stones, and they put like one new song on there. So you have to go buy the album to get the one new song, and then it's a bunch of other greatest hits. So so this is like a bunch of greatest hits, but there's more than just the one new song on there. There's original stuff in there as well, correct? 100%. So not only is there a lot of new original material that some of our historians wrote to to add to the piece, but uh, every blog post that we've featured in this series uh, also has new additional content, whether that be uh, new sources that weren't available when the author originally wrote that piece, um, whether it be the addition of some stories they didn't really have room for uh, in, in the first round when they put this on the blog years ago. Um, and even, you know, going back and having our authors add uh, more historical context to these pieces by um, adding footnotes to all of their primary source material, adding bibliographies, really um, having folks have the opportunity to more readily um, see what has influenced historically, influenced these blog posts, influenced these historians, and hopefully turn them on to some sources that they've, they've not had an opportunity to read or work with before. So a whole lot of new stuff in there, in addition to the greatest hits. Um, I, you know, I, to me, it would be more like a greatest hits double album, where you're getting oh. the you're getting the greatest hits on you know side one, side two. You're getting a whole listing of of unreleased, previously un uh, unpublished uh, sources and, and 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 new stuff. So uh, I, I can't uh, tell you how exciting it is to see this stuff in print and, and not only in print, but all the new stuff that's in there. You know, there's gonna be um, something for everyone in these volumes. So we not only get Dan Welch's version of Satisfaction, but then we also get like Pap Green on Cult Hill. You know, 
Right. And that, you know, that's a great, uh, uh, you know, a great transition there, Chris, is, I'm you know, full of this one, today. I'm full you of this. really, you are, man. You just, you are just rolling with this interview. Uh, but um, no, you know, one of the things that I, I've covered so far pretty well, I think, is is the uh, talking about the idea of the blog posts that are in there. But, you know, we wanted to fully incorporate all that emerging civil war has done over the last 10 years in this, this commemoration, this celebration um, of these hardcover books. And, um, so one of the things we did include are some of our symposium lectures, um, some of our podcasts, you know, not all of our, our readership, um, is able to come to the symposium, whether that be, you know, uh, from getting time off or traveling, it's too far away, or, you know, it's burnt during vacation time. And although, um, you know, we have such a great relationship with C-SPAN that, that airs, you know, our, our recorded, uh, symposium presentations, quite regularly, um, we want to have an opportunity to to get those in print as well and make them available in, in many different ways. Um, so not only are you getting those blog posts, but you're getting some of the podcasts that we've done in the 10 years. You're getting some of the symposium lectures that we've done. And each one of those, you know, we've had those individuals go back in and um, really go through and, and add a lot of new stuff in there. You know, when, when you're in front of that camera on C-SPAN, the clock's running. And uh, you know, there's only so much of a story you can tell in 45 minutes. And, and by going back into these transcripts of, of a podcast that is limited to time and, and a symposium talk here, maybe able to add in some of those quotes you weren't able to. Maybe you were able to um, strengthen your, your concluding argument with uh, uh, some additional space that you didn't have in the last 30 seconds, uh, getting that, that wrap up uh, signal in the back of the room. So um, it's a wide variety that is really showcasing the extent that of media that ECW has put out from print to uh, audio to video to in-person presentations. Um, again, it, these are going to be volumes that I really think will add a lot to the Civil War historiography on these topics, also bring a lot of, of different avenues of what ECW has done within those topics. Uh, you mentioned plural volumes. I want to touch on that in just a second. But as you've been talking about all the the content as far as blog posts, and new material, and podcasts, and and uh, symposium talks and, and things, um, your your main task was to try to curate this collection and look over ten years worth of material and say, here's what we want to include, and here's what we want to how we want to order that all together. Tell me a little bit about that process behind the scenes. You know, it was a very interesting process. And I think for me, having the opportunity to work as an editor on these volumes um, was an opportunity to see the other side of the pen. And one of the things when you're putting together a volume such as this, um, there's been a lot of really great examples to follow in the Civil War historiography app that, that's out there. I mean, I think of, you know, Gary Gallagher's um, essay collections that he's assembled on pretty much every battle or campaign uh, that features a number of historians um, as a really good template that was really instructive um, that, you know, recognizes there's no way in one collection you're going to cover the entirety of that subject. Um, but in broad brush strokes, you need, need to be able to tell the larger narrative but with the finer detail within each essay to really um, focus on something that has not been covered, something that has not um, been highlighted enough in some of uh, the work that's out there. So I think one of the challenges for me was, you know, going through, as you mentioned, all of this uh, different types of media that emerging civil wars covered on these topics of, of Vicksburg and Tullahoma and Gettysburg and find pieces that not only tell the larger narrative, bring to light stories that, that have not necessarily been brought to light before, do not receive a lot of attention, but still reads in a very narrative story-like fashion. So that when you pick up the Gettysburg volume, for example, you know, you're going to start with um, not July 1, but some of the events that came before in the month of June uh, during the, the, the advance in towards Maryland and Pennsylvania. And then it's going to take you through events that happen on July 1, two and three. And then we're going to look at things that um, have been much in vogue as far as uh, Civil War scholarship, topics and themes such as 
memory and history uh, or historiography and monuments, um, things that will take you through the post-war era and into modern day and how that all ties together. So you're looking for something that tells the entirety of the story and at the same time drills down on lesser known portions of that story and all together will form a very flowing narrative that, that leaves the reader with a, a satisfied feeling of they got a really good picture of, of this topic from all of these different historians and writers and bloggers from emerging civil war. And, you know, the way we approach these collections, you know, you're not going to pick it up and read it from beginning to end and suddenly know everything that happened to the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, from a narrative point of view, you know, pick up Stephen Sears' book or, or you know, someone else's if you want that. But instead, it's sort of like, here's some stuff that chronologically ordered, you know, tells that larger narrative. Um, one of the ways that we sort of approach our work at Emerging Civil War is, who happens to just be interested in a particular topic at any particular moment? Okay, well, that's what I'm going to blog about today. And so, you know, there's never been over 10 years a holistic effort to say, like, we need to make sure that we have told the chronological narrative history of Gettysburg through our blog post. It's just, yeah, I'm interested in writing about Sally the War Dog today. I'm interested in writing about the rocks of Devil's Den, you know, and so it's just what captures people's interest. Um, so was that schizophrenic for you to have to kind of figure out? Because <laughs> you are imposing some sort of order on all that after 10 years. Yeah, you know, I think the, the first thing, you know, <clears throat> tackling topics like Tullahoma and Vicksburg, um, you know, is a whole nother bailiwick. Um, you know, a large cadre of our historians uh, and bloggers with ECW are Eastern theater, um, not only in interest, but also in physical location and have really dedicated a lot of their, their research and their battlefield tours and programs and things of that nature on Eastern theater battles. So um, going through something like Vicksburg and Tullahoma was, was really rewarding to get to know, um, you know, what some of our, 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 our friends within our organization um, have worked on on Western theater stuff. Um, so that was a little less daunting because, uh, you know, our good friend Matt Atkinson a number of years ago did the uh, Gettysburg versus Vicksburg talk at the, one of the symposiums, you know, and which one is the, the turning point. And, you know, he began that program by talking about, um, and I remember him telling the story of going onto Amazon and typing in Gettysburg and typing into Vicksburg and seeing how many hits came up for each of them in the book category and far and away um you know not just here at ecw but in civil war scholarship in general that you know eastern theater stuff just uh, outruns and out publishes and out every outshines every aspect of western and trans mississippi theater so you know looking at the tullahoma and vicksburg um materials for for our second volume that's coming out um was was much less schizophrenic uh and it was much more clear to pull a large narrative that featured um, hidden or or less popular topics um, that tell the larger story. Uh, Gettysburg. Considering that for half of half of the Civil War audience, Vicksburg itself is a hidden story. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Hello, what? Uh, Hello, uh, uh, Vicksburg aware? Uh, <laughs> dead Yankees in a swamp down there? What? What? You know. Um, but, you know, Gettysburg then, oh my goodness, um, you know, all of us here at ECW, Eastern fo theater folks, Western theater folks, I mean, Gettysburg is the perennial touchstone for, for the entire Civil War community. So, you know, really call, calling together a, um, a collection that was not only representative of all the different types of media that ECW has been involved with over the years, but also a collection that features many different historical voices from our writers and bloggers um, and assembling these in a chronological way um, that if you were to read it from cover to cover, you know, you could get that narrative flow um, or you could, you know, surgically read it and, and go from topic to topic that you're interested in. Um, Gettysburg Watch was much more schizophrenic and, and really um, the hardest part of that was just mining through all the stuff that ECW has done on Gettysburg. And it, we have made a significant um, dent, uh, or shall I say a significant portion of a shelf on the Civil War uh, historiography bookshelf, if you will, um, from our writers and historians at, at Emerging Civil War. So um, 
that was a much longer and slower process. But nonetheless, even for a Gettysburg guy like myself, um, you know, a rewarding experience. I, I think of, uh, you know, our, our own Sarah Byerly. Uh, you know, she has a piece in there on Herman Hopped and the, re the repair of the railroads leading into Gettysburg in the days after after the battle. And, and I think, you know, my God, this guy's a, a Gettysburg local. Uh, you know, he's familiar with the area. You know, he's coming back to restore important and vital rail service. Um, and he's forgotten about, you know. And we, we really, in the, in the larger traditional narrative, the armies pack up and they move away and Meade chases Lee back to Virginia. And, and so we forget about some of these things. And so some of those, those topics like that was a really good, um, refresher for me to constantly be reminded that there is more to the story than blood and guts um when we've got blood and guts in this volume that's for sure um but there's there's so many other aspects um and i think that's one of the things that that emerging civil war does so well is that we're able to feature a cadre of historians with those different disparate interests that you mentioned um and it really opens opens the door to further exploration and study of these, these important moments in American history. You know what was schizophrenic about it for me, and it, it was crazy to discover this after the fact, but I have, over our 10 years, written more about Vicksburg than Gettysburg. And like, you know, Gettysburg was my first Civil War battlefield. I mean, I grew up not far from there. Um, I, you know, I'm relatively physically close, only two and a quarter hours away. I go there fairly frequently. And yet I had written more about Vicksburg where I've only had the privilege to visit twice. And it was like, wow, that's a little crazy. Um, so surprising. <laughs> and, and, and then here you are, like, you know, you work there and you're still finding stuff that is surprising and unexpected. Uh, oh, you know, hundred percent. And, and I'll share this story with our listening audience, our viewing audience, you know, as Chris and I were tackling these projects as co-editors, um, you know, Chris contributed many new original pieces um, to both volumes that I think uh, folks are really going to want to read once you pick them up. But, um, you know, I'm receiving these pieces from you and I'm seeing titles like, you know, Vicksburg Travel Log and Battle of Jackson and Vicksburg on the 4th of July. And I'm like, my God, I, what happened to this Eastern theater guy? I mean, he's been, he's <laughs> been drinking the Western theater Kool-Aid or something. Um, so no, you're right. It was, you know, it was one of those things that, um, I, I think was, is a great lesson for not only all of us here at Emergency Civil War, but, um, you know, uh, our viewers, uh, that, that read the blog and, and, and the Civil War, our colleagues in the Civil War community that, um, there are more events, um, than just South Central Pennsylvania in July 1, 2, and 3. And to really have a, a to, to be a well-rounded historian and, and to be someone well-rounded with the American Civil War, that it's okay to go outside your comfort zone, um, even if you've only visited Vicksburg once or twice, and to dig into the primary sources and utilize letters and diaries and start putting these, these narratives together. And I know for myself as a researcher and a writer that I don't understand a topic to the extent that I am able to until I do those things, you know, until I sit down and dig into it and write about it. And once I've written about it, whether published or not, um, it's there. And I'll have that, that, that broad narrative, that overview for, you know, as long as, I, as long as I'm still upright and ventilating <laughs> on my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that whole notion of, of, you know, writing about it to learn about it for me is a huge motivating factor. Um, and one of the reasons why, you know, tackling something new is kind of fun because there's a chance to learn something new and something different. So now you, we, we made the, the very explicit decision that we didn't want to be just Gettysburg for our first outing. So we were looking at the summer of 63. Uh, but the quantity of material turned into two books rather than one. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, so the original intent of the project was was one volume that, it, I, you know, regardless of your level of knowledge of the Civil War um, or your level of interest or how much you've studied or how much you've read, I think everybody would be on the same page, um, you know, whether a Western theater, Eastern theater guy, that 1863 is a pivotal year. Um, and the, the most pivotal actions of 1863 
for the Union war effort is the summer of 1863 in the campaigns of Gettysburg, Vicksburg, and Tullahoma. And so we came up with this idea of, all right, well, Gettysburg gets a lot of focus here at ECW and every history uh, per history minded person um, out there. So, you know, let's look at some of those other events. Let's tie it together and really show that these events taken as a whole create this important moment in the summer months of 1863. But as we dug into it um, and we started looking at all the things that ECW has done on those events of the summer of 1863, we realized that to really do justification, um, to, to really argue um, our thesis for these two volumes, that summer of 1863 is, is incredibly important to the Union war effort and perhaps um, not any singular one of those events is the turning point. The summer itself uh, is really a dramatic moment in this war effort. But to do that, that thesis, to do that idea, to successfully um, argue that case, that we needed to, to really expand it into two volumes um, and make sure that we did not give short shrift to the importance of the events that happened during the Gettysburg, or excuse me, the Vicksburg campaign and the Tullahoma campaign. Uh, and, you know, I'm someone who would argue that, that um, you know, Tullahoma needs to be talked about in the same sentence as Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Yes. Because it's, you know, a, a huge win for the Union Army. And, you know, I'm also one of those guys that thinks Vicksburg was probably more important than Gettysburg um, strategically overall. And I know that's... Um, sacrilegious uh, sacrilegious to see you're gonna get, i'll tell you you're gonna get some hate mail once this thing goes uh gets posted <laughs> <laughs> so so having these two books in conversation with each other was really important once we decided to split them into two um uh, because of the way things have been going uh in the post covid or i guess we're not out of covid but out of the the post shutdown that COVID triggered with the publishing industry. Um, and as Ted Savas and Savas Beatty were getting things back up and going, um, he wasn't able to get both books out simultaneously because of, of uh, backups at the printer. So the Gettysburg book is out. The Vicksburg Tullahoma book will be out by the symposium. Um, and then folks will be able to kind of see both of them and have them in conversation together. Uh, yeah. You know, and, I, and I'm not, <clears throat> um, you know, I should be, the better salesman here. And, and I'm not saying that for every, every uh, person, they're going to want both volumes, but I, I can't see, um, you know, first of all, the, the design effort that has gone into these, they're going to look great side by side on your shelf. Um, I'm a bibliophile. I love the way, you know, certain sets look on a bookshelf that, you know, there's the highlight of my library for me is having my ORs on bookshelves behind glass doors and lit you know i mean you just go in there and they just look nice they just look nice so um, from that perspective you're going to want both of these volumes but you know um you know for any of our, our our readers and our followers um of the podcast and the blog you know if you picked up gettysburg already you're going to want vicksburg to really get a understanding of a wide swath of things that led to these important important moments in May, June, July of 1863, um, you need to have both volumes and um, highly recommend that you pick up both. Yeah, and, and that was one of the things that we were torn about when we decided to split into two books. It's like, well, you know, we don't want people to just go and gobble up the Gettysburg book and think like that's the end all be all because because these events really do need to be in conversation with each other in order to, uh, you know, as you say, that's our thesis. Uh, so to sort of understand the pivotal nature of that summer, you really kind of have to see them all. Let me see if I can um, do the magic of screen share for a second here. So we can take a look at, uh, here we go. Let me see, did I get this right? Are we seeing this here, the, the two books along with my cluttered desktop? Um, I see uh, the summer of 1863 there. All right, very good. So, um, as a Gettysburg guy, tell me uh, about this statue that is on the cover here. This is a photo by Chris Heise, um, who is one of our uh, contributors, and he did a lot of special photography for these books. Tell me about the uh, the cover image here. You know, and, and before we, we talk about that, you raised something that we haven't even talked about yet. Is We've talked a lot about the writing and the scholarship that's in there, but um, these things are packed full of um, original maps 
that we've had created by our own Edward Alexander to accompany these, these volumes. They're packed full of amazing photography from Chris Heisey. Uh, they're also packed full of images of commanders, civilians, battlefields. Um, the, the visual aspect of these books, uh, I think, is just, just stunning. And uh, what a great segue is, is diving into, you know, one of these monuments that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. Um, you know, you, when you think about Gettysburg and particularly Vicksburg, um, I think one of the great juxtapositions are those are battlefields that are heavily, uh, heavily laden with um, monuments. Um, you know, Gettysburg has about 1,400 monuments uh, and markers on the field at Gettysburg itself. That includes, you know, monuments to um, individuals, monuments to um, units, monuments to regiments, monuments to batteries. I mean, it, there's a whole host of, of monuments and uh, to monuments to states, um, you know, but it's impossible to stop at every single one of these. Um, and so, this is one um, that is after an individual. This monument is dedicated um, to Major William Wells of the 1st Vermont Cavalry Regiment. Uh, as you're making your way along the southern end of the battlefield, as you're passing up and over Big Round Top, uh, coming down the northern slope of Big Round Top and beginning to work your way towards Little Round Top, this is the, the area that we're talking about. Um, William Wells was a major in the 1st Vermont Cavalry and he led a battalion of the 1st Vermont um, during a really famous cavalry charge on July 3rd, 1863, known as Farnsworth's Charge. Um, by the end of the war, uh, Wells had risen through the ranks. He'd go on to be a, a brevet major general by the end. Um, but for his actions here at Gettysburg on July 3rd, um, leading a battalion of the, the 1st Vermont, he's going to be awarded the Medal of Honor. And so this monument um, not only depicts Wells himself um, during the battle, but if you notice on the, uh, the, the bottom of the picture, his uh, bronze statue sits on top of a boulder, very prominent on the southern end of the battlefield are these, these large rocks, Devil's Den, if you think about that. And, and just below, uh, beyond the picture there, there is a, a ball relief or a bronze uh, picture depicting the charge itself. So, you know, I think that even in our, even in the selection of, of images that Chris Heisey uh, contributed to the volume, um, un underscores again, I think what one of the strong suits of emerging civil war is, is highlighting these important stories that often get overlooked. I mean, it would have been very simple for us to, to choose a picture of the Fields of Pickett's Charge or uh, the 20th Maine Monument. But, you know, here's a monument to a major on July 3rd, 1863, that just led a battalion, not even the entire regiment, into the charge. So, um, again, highlighting one of those lesser known stories, highlighting one of those monuments that few folks ever stop at. Um, you know, they just keep driving by, rushing to get to the 20th Main, rushing to get to, to Little Round Top. So, um, what a great way to start the book visually uh, and historically. You know, and uh, it was tough to pick the image because um, this is a monument that Chris likes and, and he's photographed many times. So he gave us several versions and in different seasons. And so there were different color schemes based on the foliage. Uh, it was really tough to, to pick the final version here. Let me show you the um, Vicksburg cover here for a second. Um, and here we're looking at the monument for the Wisconsin Memorial. Um, and... Uh, uh, the, that's a, a big, highly visible monument on the uh, the battlefield there in Vicksburg. And uh, this is uh, an infantryman who is captured uh, in bronze on that um, giant memorial. There's also someone representing the cavalry, someone representing the uh, um, artillery. And then at the very top is old Abe the War Eagle, who is also a Wisconsinite. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's, it, you know, one of the things for me that was really fun was inviting Chris to uh, contribute a photo essay to each of these books and kind of working with him to pick out the pictures that really kind of showed off his own work and, and how does he see the battlefield when he's out taking pictures. And so um, it was really kind of, a, you know, as Dan said, kind of a neat way for us to show um, the many different media that we're able to, uh, to take advantage of with the ECW. So, um, so Gettysburg seems like 
an obvious easy pick for a first book. Um, any qualms about that? Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> working for Gettysburg for the, uh, pardon that noise there, but um, working for Gettysburg uh, for a number of years, working here at the park, um, you know, um, writing about Gettysburg, publishing about Gettysburg, not only does it have such a huge body of Civil War histo uh, uh, contribution to Civil War histo historiography and you know, going back to that talk that Matt gave, I think he said there was something, you know, like 7,000 or 9,000 books listed on Amazon um, as of several years ago on the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, folks are drawn to Gettysburg, enthusiasts, buffs, historians are drawn to Gettysburg like no other battlefield. Um, and so to write or to publish anything on Gettysburg is going to get a much harder review um, from that community than um, Vicksburg or Tullahoma. Um, you know, I, I had a conversation with, with a gentleman here on the battlefield today that, you know, didn't know about Vicksburg, had been to Gettysburg many, many times, didn't know that, that Vicksburg had come to a conclusion at the same time as Gettysburg. And I said, you know, you want to talk about the ability of the Confederacy to, to, to get horse flesh um, the Tullahoma campaign pretty much ends that the ability for the Confederacy, because this is the mm -hmm. area of the country that's providing the most amount of horse flesh for the Confederacy. So, um, you know, Tull Tullahoma is not only a um, bloodless but strategic victory um, for the, the Union Army uh, and the federal government at this time. Um, it, it also has far reaching implications um, in the summer of 1863 and the Confederate war effort going forward. Um, so. You know, you'll be hard pressed to find uh, many ravenous Tullahoma uh, battlefield visitors and trompers and, and enthusiasts, um, uh, let alone Vicksburg, uh, although it does have its, its, its niche out there. So, you know, Gettysburg does seem like the obvious choice to lead off with. Uh, you'd think, you know, a hey, emergency civil war is going to take a, a hit on the, one of the, these big softballs with, uh, with Gettysburg. But you know, when you take something like Gettysburg on, you realize that it's going to get the most number of eyes. Um, you know, as working as a park ranger at Gettysburg, we often get the stump the ranger type enthusiasts. Oh, yeah. And it's, well, you know, do you know how many shoelaces William Barksdale had on that day? And, you know, what size shoe he wore? And, you know, and the exact blade of grass he was standing on when he, you know, received his mortal wounds. So um, to make sure that we were uh, able to not only um, entertain the crowd with our, what we've been able to produce, that audience, um, but also to bring some of these things that don't get often talked about um, in, into the forefront with them um, and do it in such a way that is accessible. Um, you know, a first time uh, emerging Civil War reader will love these books. Um, it really highlights everything that emerging civil war is about. Um, and someone that is a long time, you know, visits Gettysburg every four months for the last 30 years, has read every book, um, has got the Gettysburg bumper sticker on the car and the soundtrack permanently jammed into their CD player. Um, they're going to find stuff in there too. And the level of scholarship that the historians at emerging civil war have put into these works as it relates to Gettysburg and Vicksburg and Tullahoma um, is uh, top notch. Um, mm -hmm. So there's going to be something for everyone in there, uh, even though, you know, Gettysburg seemed like the safe bet. Um, you know, we look forward to it. You know, I, I would say speaking for, I know I have several essays in the Gettysburg volume you do as well. And I look forward to those conversations. You know, people have questions or historical um, uh, debates or, or discussions they want to have with you about your interpretation of events. Um, that's the fun part of history um, for a lot of folks. And we do it very well at Emerging Civil War. We love, <laughs> we love to have a, a, a beverage in our hand and uh, a cigar in our mouth and, and be able to, to, to Monday morning quarterback some of these historical moments um, during 1861 to 1865. And that's what, what the real fun of it is, is to, is to be able to, to discuss this in the larger community. So, um, not a softball by any stretch of the imagination. And that's why I always hope it comes across is like, you know, when, when people look at these books, I hope they realize that it comes from a bunch of guys who are really, a bunch of guys, a bunch of gals who are really glad to just be sitting around, hanging out, having a beer, smoking a cigar, uh, listening to some music, refighting the war, and, uh, you know, 
hey, how about this idea? Hey, how about that idea? And and just that fun, freewheeling exchange that that goes on when uh, when people are having a good time talking about history. A hundred percent. And I think folks will really feel that as they read these volumes. Now, because Gettysburg um, is the obvious choice, but it was really a split off from the summer of 63. So we really want people to look at these as, as a unit, but we do have other plans coming. You yeah. want to share any secrets? So we are currently uh, in the process of working on our third volume for this series, um, loosely um, based on the idea of two pivotal figures after this moment of 1863. And I think folks can tell where we're going. Um, the, you know, the showdown in the East that will become um, Lee versus Grant. And so the next volume is really gonna look at all aspects of, of Lee and Grant, um, not only as commanders, but um, with subjects ranging from um, relationships with subordinates, um, different aspects of the battles that these men fight uh, against each other and, and the armies that they bring to the fields into those fights. Um, looking at, you know, how are joint operations being done um, in 1864, excuse me, in 1865. So a whole host again of, of topics and themes um, that are going to give readers a, just a, a, a really large brushstroke of, of even a little bit before May of 1864 through, through mid-April of 1865. But at the same time, highlight, for example, I can think of, of a piece that we have going in there about um, what was it like for a soldier after they got their parole pass at Appomattox? Where did they go? How long did it take them? What was that experience like? Um, following, um, you know, uh, human elements of the Battle of Spotsylvania, we think about the, the horrific bloodletting in May and June of 1864, but moments where, you know, there was uh, elements of, of humanity, where I can think of a piece of um, Civil War music being performed on the entrenchments uh, on the battlefield at, at Spotsylvania in between engagements. So, um, again, it, you know, this is just a preview of some of the fascinating topics that, that our cadre of of authors and bloggers and historians at, at Emerging Civil War are going to bring in this next volume. And I, I, I can tell you right now, um, again, these are huge topics. So a little schizophrenic trying to, to, <laughs> to, to, to bridge all these things together and put them together. But it has been such a delight reading um, through some of the stuff that our, our, you know, our cadre has really put together in the last 10 years. Um, on these these different aspects of 1864, 1865, with Lee and Grant at the helm. Um, and I can tell you, listeners, viewers, um, that when this volume comes out, it not only is it going to really complement the other two volumes we hope you have on your shelf, um, but uh, it's going to be one you're not going to want to miss. And I've got to give a big shout out to our publisher, Ted Savis, because when I first approached him about this idea and, and I thought we'd just do like a single collection, you know, 10th anniversary, let's do something kind of fun. And he's like, no, think of a series. Let's do multiple books. Um, so he's really given us a free reign to kind of explore and curate and pick and choose. And, and so aside from these first two that are, that'll be out now, and then the uh, Grant Lee book that'll be out by the end of the year, um, we've got some other cool ideas that are percolating down down the road uh, to kind of round out because this is the 10th anniversary year and we're looking at it as a year-long project so um, go ahead yeah you know i was going to say chris that i think that uh, that's a great thing to, to remind our audience is that we're not done yet um, we're not going to cap it with the summer of 1863 uh, we're not going to end with lee and grant at appomattox that we have several more volumes planned and uh um you know, I know that one of the, the benefits of working on these projects is the opportunity to, to really get to read all these things again and revisit these topics, um, read about new aspects, new research, um, you know, things you don't think about, you know, uh, adding the idea of photography and art, uh, such as Chris Heisey's pieces uh, into all this. So, um, you know, that's that's the benefit for me is, is getting that opportunity. And I, you know, I can't wait to put these into a format that, that, that be able to share that, that enjoyment with our audience and, and new folks as well that we hope will, will pick these up. 
You know, I love the fact that we're showing off the work of, of so many of our peers. Uh, we haven't mentioned uh, the maps that Hal Jesperson and Edward Alexander have contributed to these volumes. We've dipped into our archives to pull out some great Hal maps, and, and Edward has done some original stuff for us for the series. Um, how important are maps to a collection like this? Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, my advice as a bibliophile is that if you pick up a, a book on the Civil War, um, that has any sort of um, relationship to military aspects or battles or campaigns. If it doesn't have maps, put it back on the shelf. Um, if it doesn't have good maps, put it back on the shelf. Or, um, you know, one of the, the great series is that, that uh, Ted Savas and Savas Beatty have put out is that uh, Civil War Map Encyclopedia series, um, you know, or pick up one of those to go along with that reading. Maps are critical to understanding not only what um, takes place uh, during these these battles and these campaigns and where, um, but also you know some of our maps that I'll transition into are modern day maps of uh, you know the map that you're looking at of of troop movements will show the historic perspective of what these grounds looked like during that battle or campaign, but it may not necessarily be how those things look today. And one of the, the great things, uh, the maps that, uh, that Edward created for us, um, our own Edward Alexander, are modern day maps of Vicksburg and Gettysburg and uh, highlighting the different tour routes and, and things you'll see like the visitor center and um, different tour stops along the way. But we've been able to uh, place each essay from these series to a, to a physical location on these battlefields, you know? So if you wanna read my essay about George Sears Green um, at Culp's Hill, for example, if, you know, based on my symposium talk from several years ago, uh, it's gonna show you how to get there. Uh, you know, if you wanna read about Sally, uh, the war dog of the 11th Pennsylvania, um, it's gonna show you where that's located uh, on, on the, the modern day tour roads. So you're gonna be able to also take these books to uh, with you to these places, read these essays on the ground, where they happened. Uh, and you just simply can't do that without a map. And uh, again, I, between Hal and Edward, I think a, a lot of folks are gonna be really excited with the maps that, that these volumes are gonna highlight. Now, before we wrap up, um, one final question for you, kind of, kind of more on a personal level, but, um, and of course I mentioned we've got more books to come and then Dan got this look on his face like, oh my God, that's right. Uh, uh, you know, I know. <laughs> like, oh boy. Kind of like, kind of kind of worried there for a second. Um, but one reason you, you wanted to, to really take the helm on this project was because you wanted to learn how to be an editor. It was a skill set that you want to develop. Uh, as a historian and as a writer, something that uh, uh, you just sort of worked on around the edges. So uh, what kind of education has this been for you? Definitely not a career choice for me, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, in 100%, um, you know, when we had originally talked about this project and, and talked about it with Ted, you know, the opportunity to, to be a co-editor on this project um, showed me that other side of the pen that I hadn't done yet. Um, you know, um, we've all edited our own work or hopefully have edited our own work and we do those things in a very different way, but doing it, uh, as in a volume such as this, um, trying to find a common voice between disparate authors, um, trying to, um, you know, I always rag on the Oxford comma, but to make sure that you've got the Oxford comma where it needs to be that, you know, coordinating conjunctions are in the right place. Um, it is tedious. It is slow going for someone just entering into this area of, of being a historian, um, but it was incredibly valuable um, it, to not only see different writing styles, um, but to realize some of the challenges um, that in my own writing that I've discovered as a result of working with others writing, you know, saying, oh, well, this is a better, this is a better way to write. This is a better voice to use. This is a, um, you know, a better uh, a transition, if you will. Um, so definitely a great learning opportunity. Um, but I will definitely say that um, being on this side of the pen, there are two aspects that have uh, made my hair a little little further back on the forehead and a little grayer is uh, who footnotes and indexing. Those are the bane of an editor's existence. Um, that is a 
special someone that wants to do that as a career. <laughs> <laughs> Those are challenges. And, you know, one of the things you, you sort of touch on too is, you know, there's that very micro level, you know, commas and grammar stuff. And then there's the macro, we need to shape the book and what's the voice. And, you know, some of that stuff is more fun than others. And uh, for some people, you know, the other stuff is more fun. Um, so, you know, it is about sort of figuring out where your interests are and your strengths and, and that kind of stuff. You know, and, and it, this, this, the opportunity is the old adage. Um, I wanted to see how the sausage was made. I saw how the sausage was made. And it is a, uh, it's a very interesting process. It's a great learning opportunity um, for myself and very privileged for that opportunity. Um, but, um, you know, we hope that if we did our jobs right, I feel as co-editors, we did our jobs right, that this will be a, a, a seamless work that will really speak to our readers. Um, and we oftentimes don't talk about as, as writers, uh, we don't talk about the, how the sausage is made. You know, how does this go from telling a story to citing the different primary sources, supporting your argument, having those transitory uh, statements from one idea to the next. Um, providing a strong conclusion. We don't talk a little, we don't talk a lot about the sausage making process of, of bringing a piece to life and, and entering it into a very um, diverse historiography in this field. So um, this was a great opportunity to do so. So that is such a, such a kind way of saying all of that. You know, for my part, I'm like, oh, thank heaven. Somebody else now sees how the sausage is made. You know, like, now maybe someone will understand me. Saying, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I'll eat sausage for a while, but <laughs> no, that's, 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 yeah. 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 Dan, it's been great to chat with you. Of course, always a, a pleasure to work with you, but thanks for um, sharing your insights and your thoughts about this. Uh, you know, for me, what's a really exciting project and I, I hope it'll be for our readers too. A wonderful opportunity. Again, Chris, can't thank you and Ted enough for uh, being able to to contribute to this series. And uh, I really hope that, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of folks that get interested and excited about it just as much as you and I are, because um, I think it really shows off everything that Emerging Civil War has uh, been able to do in the last 10 years. And we would love for you to celebrate and commemorate our 10th anniversary by picking up a copy of these volumes. That's right. We're hoping that you guys will have something to celebrate too. Dan, thanks so much. I'm Chris Bukowski for Dan Welch, Emerging Civil War. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.